Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon's event, Exceeding Expectations, a how-to workshop. We're incredibly excited to have you all join us this, for this event. Um, we've had multiple institutions, uh, both universities and specialist centres across the UK sign up, uh, which really lends itself well to having some fruitful conversations in part two of today. So just to provide some context before we kick off as to why we're hosting this event, Last year, you'll be aware that the Office for Students published their statement, statement of Expectations, uh, a seven-point guidance on what they believe higher edu education institutions should be doing to tackle harassment and sexual misconduct on campus. The guidance was much needed, and as I'm sure many of us agree, also long overdue. As a sector, we've known of, his of issues of harassment, um, particularly in the case of sexual misconduct, for well over a decade. Conversations on prevalence continue to prevail and unfortunately, in some cases, uh, act as a hindrance to action and to progress. So we wrote the Exceeding Expectations Handbook uh, as a way to support you, the practitioners of change, in taking meaningful action uh, in a way that doesn't just meet the expectations set out by the Office for Student, but does in fact exceed them, hopefully saving you time and resource and investment in the long run. The report's free and available for download, and I'll follow up after this event with a recording of the session and also details on how you can access that document if you've not had the opportunity to do so already. So today's event really just builds on that. Uh, and we're joined by our panelists who I'll introduce you to in a moment. Um, and just to give you a bit of context on how the session is going to run, we're going to split the day into two hour sessions. The first hour will be a panel discussion where we'll be looking at how we can effectively support students through the reporting process, touching on challenges that you face uh, across the industry, um, as well as thoughts on how these may be overcome. You'll also have the opportunity to ask the question ask questions to the panel, so please use the chat function to keep those coming through. Um, in the second hour, we will be breaking out into breakout rooms where we'll be providing you with case studies that you can discuss uh, in your groups that will allow you to then apply the learning from this session and from the Exceeding Expectations Handbook if you've had the opportunity to read that. But I'll provide more detail on that uh, closer to the second half. Um, just a quick note, the session is being recorded. Uh, so if you do pop on camera or turn off your microphone, um, you, you may be caught on, you may be caught on camera. Um, and also, uh, again, for the second part of the session, we'll come on to some housekeeping later, uh, but these will be randomly assigned um, to you at that point in time. Uh, so without further ado then, if our panelists would like to come on camera and off of mute, then we will kick off. I can see Georgina. Yeah, brilliant. Perfect. So we'll start off with introducing the panel. Uh, and also, as you introduce yourself, if you'd like to then give us your thoughts on the current condition of harassment reporting in higher education. Uh, Georgina, would we like to start with you? Yes, thanks, Kenya. It's really great to be um, part of this discussion and um, I'm glad to contribute whatever whatever small insight I can. Um, I'm a discrimination lawyer. I work for the law firm McAllister Olivarius and I and we have done a lot of work in the university sector, both in the UK and the US, actually, although my um, focus is in the UK. And from that um, particular stance, I have um, for many years been working uh, in relation to complaints, in, re in relation to complaining about the way complaints are handled within universities. So I have a very sort of particular and perhaps for this audience slightly odd stance in that um, I first came to this as a um, pr protagonist of, of complaint or objection to the way that um, complaints were handled and uh, putting forward the argument that the complaints process itself, because it treats, it has always tended to treat the complainant differently from the person accused and um, has accorded certain protections, uh, natural justice protections to the accused that it has not afforded to a complainant is itself discrim discriminatory. So if you put aside the original harassment that's being complained about, which itself might be a basis for complaint or claim against the university, if you put that aside and you just look at the way the complaint was handled, it can well be argued that that is indirectly discriminatory as well. Um, so I've been working for 
complainants um, putting forward that argument for quite a long time now. But I'm not just in the business of bringing claims against universities. I and the rest of my firm would actually like to see um, universities do better. And we don't necessarily want to use a stick if we can also use a carrot or at least give some assistance and guidance. And the least we can do is explain what to us would seem to be a good process so that we can't, we wouldn't think that we can bring a claim against you. And so I've been working um, towards that with the 1752 group, which is um, some of you may have heard of. It's a research and lobbying organization um, made up of academics, founded by academics. So all with the view of making universities a better place. So it comes from a place of support and sort of positive energy. And we produced a sector guidance where we suggested a step-by-step -step approach um, as to how universities could do better. So that's that's me. Sorry, that was a rather long introduction, but that kind of also helps explain my perspective on the status of complaints handling right now. And unfortunately, although there have been um, good progress in the sector since the 1752 group started making a noise about it, since various others did, the NUS and um, even Universities UK brought out um, better guidance in 2016. So, and since then there have been, um, the OIA has brought out guidance, um, the EHRC has weighed in. Um, there are a lot of reports telling universities in very broad terms what's expected of them, but there are two problems. Well, but it clearly isn't working because I still have um, potential claimants, individuals knocking on my door, students or staff members who have been sexually harassed or subjected to violence on campus who still are unable to properly report or have an adequate um, complaints process that treats them fairly. And so um, it's not quite trickling down into the everyday way in which complaints are handled, the changes that are being suggested by the various sector bodies. So I do tend to think that the only way forward is not just a statement of expectations, but actually a mandatory set of guidelines that are specific enough to actually explain to universities how on a day-to-day -day basis they should be handling complaints. Thank you, Georgina. That's uh, fantastic. Thank you. Um, well, now that we're here, Danny, would you like to <laughs> pick up and introduce yourself and also give your thoughts on the current condition of harassment reporting in higher education? Yeah, thank you so much. And um, thank you so much for having me today. Um, I mean, I completely agree with everything um, Georgina just said. Um, I'll, I'll introduce myself first. Um, I'm Danny Bradford. Um, on the one hand, I work as a freelance researcher, specifically looking at at sexual harassment during um, academic fieldwork. Um, but the capacity in which I'm here today is more to talk about the experience of a student who has gone through um, a disciplinary procedure about sexual violence. Um, so that's kind of where I'm coming from today. I have the kind of research background, but I also have that, that personal experience. In terms of where I think we are as a sector, I think at the moment we're in a position where every couple of months there is some type of investigation or expose um, in the media that looks at cases that have been mishandled in universities. When that happens, there is kind of large scale sector outrage. There's, there may be open letters, there may be protests on campus, there may be new guidance that comes out. Then slowly that outrage kind of dies down, limited progress is made, people kind of forget about it. The same thing happens a few months later. Um, every few months I see someone posing the question, is this uh, academia's um, Me Too moment uh, and it never seems to be because you're asking that question every few months um, and whilst there has been some progress and, and increasingly more guidance being produced um, change on the ground for the students who are, who are making these complaints has been really slow. Um, Georgina picked up on a point which was about the rights being afforded to the complainant versus um, the accused um, and I'd like to touch on that a little bit because in my case, that was that was the biggest issue was was that disparity in, in rights for the complainant versus the accused. So I took a complaint in uh, 2018, I think it was now, I can't believe it's three years ago now. Um, and my complaint was actually upheld. So they, they found enough evidence to say that, yes, we do believe that this happened. And at the time, um, we believe that it was the only case that had ever been upheld at that university under that disciplinary procedure which is quite a statement given that there were uh, a considerable number of reports. 
this was partly because I had um, very strong screenshot evidence that that couldn't be refuted. Um, many people don't have that and, and their cases aren't upheld. But even with my case upheld, there were so there were so many issues with how the case itself was handled. And I've split it into three main areas. The first one was barriers to reporting. So I had no idea how to report. In fact, I filled out three separate forms and emailed five separate people who all told me that's the wrong form. You need to do this form. Um, so I had no idea how to firstly report. Secondly, I was discouraged from reporting. So I was told that I should think very seriously about whether I wanted to submit a formal report because it could damage my place in, in my department, which, I mean, they were telling the truth, it did. Um, and then the support and the rights afforded to the complainant during the process were deeply unfair. So just as a couple of examples, despite UK guidelines at the time saying that the use of a screen or even um, joining via uh, joining digitally um, for the complainant for the official hearing was an appropriate um, step to take to protect the complainant. I was refused the right of even a screen. So I was sat essentially next to the person I was complaining about throughout the whole hearing with only one person in between us. Um, I didn't have any rights to legal representation whilst he received free legal representation from the university. Um, and those are just a couple of examples that in most of these cases, the complainant is treated just as, as a peripheral witness. They're not treated any differently than someone that might have just been a bad bystander, even though they were the victim in this case. And then finally, sanctions, I think, um, as a sector, we're very reluctant to impose harsh sanctions. Um, so in my case, even though the complaint was upheld, the only sanctions were a no contact order, which actually meant that I was limited in the university facilities that I could use. For example, the library, I was only um, allowed to use three days out of the seven day week. Um, and a letter of apology, which was only about three lines long. There was no education, there was no training, even though the case was upheld. Um, so that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, at the time, my university was running um, a campaign um, to kind of showcase their support for survivors at the university. Um, at the same time, they were, in, in my opinion, mishandling complaints that were being made. So... I think that many institutions are, are doing things like um, bringing in report and support services or launching campaigns, but if at the same time they're mistreating complainants, um, then then you have a real issue here. The, the, the kind of steps they're taking seem more superficial than anything. Um, so yeah, I think that we're at a place where there is example of best practice in the sector. There are definitely some institutions that are doing well, but there are too many institutions that aren't. There are too many institutions that are kind of winging it and their processes are run by either academics who are already overworked or they're being run by staff members who are also overworked and under-resourced and aren't equipped to deal with these cases. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for that, Danny. That's incredibly interesting and I'm really enjoying a lot of the topics that are coming out at the moment, particularly around kind of the reluctance to apply sanctions and also just the guidance for people who are in the battlefield, shall we say, doing this job every day and trying to find the time to know what to do correctly and then to apply that and then to review it is incredibly time consuming, which is why I think conversations like today are incredibly important because as you said, best practice does exist. It's just about having the time and finding the time to share that. Um, and there's a lot in there around um, kind of uh, what Georgina touched on earlier on carrot and stick um, uh, approach to, to, to mandating change. Um, but before we get further into that, um, we'll just introduce um, our final panellist, Clarissa, uh, into the discussion. And Clarissa, if you'd like to also introduce yourself and then give your thoughts on the current condition of reporting within higher education. Thank you, Kenya, and thank you for, for having me here and joining this panel. Um, my name is Clarissa Humphreys. I am the Sexual Misconduct Prevention Response Manager at Durham University. And I'm also a co-author of a book called Addressing Student Sexual Violence in Higher Education, The Good Practice Guide. And um, if you were coming here today interested in a debate between the panelists, I think you'll be very disappointed because I do have to echo what Georgina and Danny have presented today um, as what I see the state of our current um, conditions of reporting in the sector at the moment. Um, Danny just said something really um, helpful around highlighting the you know, cases being mishandled in the university sector, being brought into um, 
you know, into the press and, and having media coverage of that and waiting for this Me Too movement. And I think the problem that we have is not only do we have cases that are being mishandled, but even when our cases are handled well, according to the guidance that's available to us, we are still not um, providing a service that is, is um, reducing harm, that is holding perpetrators accountable, and that is um, mitigating any potential re-traumatization of those who've been subjected to harassment or sexual violence or other forms of um, hate and violence that are happening within our institutions. And I think that's the, the worry that I have is that even when we follow directly kind of the black and white of what, for example, the OIA would have us do or our universities UK would have us to do with the current sector guidance. It's not enough. And it's not actually keeping people safe in the way that we would hope. And the feedback back that we're getting from, from those who go through the process, even when it's been handled quote unquote well, is that it's traumatic and that it's, it's, it's difficult and it's lengthy. And, um, that's a massive barrier to get people to access our procedures and our policies and safety and being able to access their education as well as their workplace in environments free from harassment, violence, or the fear of harassment and violence when we don't have the tools in place and the resources in place that are equipped to deal with these in a safe way. And Part of that has to do with the way we're structured in the sense that we ask students and staff to make complaints against another party and then we uphold or we have that complaint to be founded or not founded and then we push into a disciplinary process where the quote unquote complainant reporting party loses any rights and any any um, agency in that process and and isn't treated equally, their voice isn't heard. In some cases, they might be invited to attend a hearing in an inappropriate setting, but they lack representation, they lack access, they don't have access to appeals. And so that's um, something that um, structurally we're, we're dealing with at, a mom at the moment. And that's on top of the barriers to get the reporting that might be internal for an individual, the barriers to reporting within an institution, the lack of staff training and specialists within an organization, the lack of partnerships with specialist organizations external to a, to a university where we're building in those support networks, referral pathways and care pathways. Um, and so I think there's it sounds like a really bad news story as we're, as we're talking through this, like all, we're, everything that we're kind of highlighting here is quite negative. And I think that to pause for a moment and reflect that we're in 2021, and if we were having this conversation in 2016, we barely even had the language and scope to even have it. So we are making progress as a sector. There are institutions that are moving forward. And I don't, and I think for a lot of institutions, they want to do it well, but they maybe lack the specialty, they lack the resource or the understanding or the time to actually um, look at this um, more, more holistically and, and try to focus on that. So I think what we know as a sector is that we have high prevalence rates of sexual violence in particular. We have very low reporting rates. Um, I'm not a specialist in relation to other forms of harassment, so I won't speak to those numbers, but in relation to sexual violence, I think that's, a, that's key. And the other thing I just want to highlight is that particularly in England and Wales, we have a focus on sexual violence and we have a kind of delayed conversation now around domestic abuse. We haven't even really started to talk about stalking or other forms of gender-based violence that our students and staff are subjected to in a helpful way. Um, and we can look to the North and we can see in Scotland a lot more movement with our equally safe um, in higher education uh, guidance and a lot more uh, discussion around all forms of gender-based violence. Um, but if we're thinking about barriers to reporting, if we're not even naming some of the most common forms of violence that our students and staff are experiencing, um, that's gonna be problematic for people to feel able to come forward and discuss it. We haven't talked about online sexual misconduct, technology facilitated sexual violence. You know, People won't know that they can come to the institution and get that support or have an option to make a report. So that's a very brief kind of agreeing with Georgina and Danny and just saying there are some structural issues here that you might get onto a little bit further in our discussion. Um, but I do want to identify the fact that there has been massive progress since 2016. We just still have a lot more work to do. Agree, in, agree entirely. And you're quite right. There is a lot of kind of dwelling on the work that needs to be done. Um, but I don't think that's a negative thing because as you've said, there's progress that has been made. And the fact that everyone's on this call today speaks to the fact that people are 
continuing to do work to make more progress and continue to change the um, way things are at the moment. Um, and with that said, uh, and you spoke a bit here about the kind of structural challenges that exist at the moment, such as, you know, the procedure of going through that investigation and how we support um, c- complainants or, uh, or victim survivors through that process. Um, I want to go on a bit more to talk around um, those challenges that do exist uh, and and those challenges and hurdles that practitioners do face when working in this space, both at a local level and also looking more structurally uh, and at those kind of institutionalized barriers to change. Um, and I know we. I know you mentioned also there, Clarissa, around you know you're not a uh, you're not a specialist in other forms of harassment. But I think one of the things that we tried to capture within the exceeding expectations document was that when once we're making progress in one area, those learnings can be picked up and applied to other forms of ch- challenging other forms of harassment as well. For example, if you're looking at how you communicate your processes more widely to students that is applicable for all forms of harassment because a lot of the procedures and processes that you have in place will apply across the board um so so as people are listening please don't just think about this as a conversation on challenging harassment in sexual misconduct cases but think about it more broadly um so yeah um Clarissa, let's go back to you first on 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 that question of um what hurdles and challenges do you see uh, at the moment that are kind of prog- preventing that progress. Absolutely. So coming from a practitioner's point of view, so somebody who day in, day out is responding, uh, was working with students and staff uh, with disclosures, making reports, going through investigation processes uh, in an institution. I think locally, um, the barriers that we as practitioners, and I, 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 you know, speaking to other colleagues in the sector who do roles similar to mine um, that we face locally is... <laughs> People can be barriers. People within your institution can be barriers. You can have all of the policies and procedures and everything that you need in place, but um, individuals and people in different roles and their own personal beliefs, opinions, and ideas around how things should be done um, or around the content itself, whether we're talking about sexual violence or racial discrimination or you know any other form of hate that we might be uh, addressing, when, when we have policies and procedures, they're only as good as the people that can then in, um, interact with them and make sure that they run and that, um, are accessible. So um, Danny spoke of, you know, someone saying, oh, are you sure you want to do this because this might impact your, your relationship with the department? You know, that's a person who is putting a barrier in place of someone being able to access their support options. Um, and whereas, you know, what we would want to see is have those options open. And yes, there are risks to doing things, but we don't want to pressure people not to engage or to do or to do something, right? We want people to have non-directive signposting, make informed choices. We want non-judgmental responses um, so that people can make the choice that's best for them so that they can choose and have access to all the doors that are open for support and reporting options available. And so I think that um, both working with people who are trying to disclose um, different forms of violence and harassment, but also trying to make internal changes in an organization, um, whether it's related to not agreeing with with the changes that need to happen, preferring the status quo because that's easier and that's what we've always done, or just a lack of time because we're under-resourced, overworked kind of sector is how we tend to feel, particularly coming out of a pandemic. Um, There's a lot of things that internally I think that we can find as a barrier and that can often come down to one person. And the flip side of that is there's something in this work where we are relying on individuals to champion the work rather than having institution-wide strategic responses to harassment. So we shouldn't be relying on one individual or two individuals in an institution to create culture change and to make the organization safe for students and staff. Because in the same way that, you know, many, many people can be those barriers, many people can be the champions and create that change. And then if you rely on individuals, what you do is you risk burnout. And there's some really good academic uh, research on this where you rely on individuals and you, they burn out and then you lose that that. Um, that person who's creating that change and that all falls away for that institution. So um, that's kind of at a local level, uh, you know, 
one of many challenges and, and hurdles that we find. But I think part of addressing that comes with training, but it also comes from having that institutional leadership from the very top, from your governance team, from your council, from your university executive committees, your Senate, um, those individuals need to be championing this work. They need to be the ones saying this needs to change in order for resources and in order for other people to get in line. But also there is a level of if an organization says, this is our view, we think that this is this is our definition of harassment. As an employee of that, of that organization, whether you agree or disagree, that's the view of the organization and you work on behalf of that organization. And then I think at a, at a kind of sector-wide level, uh, the, some of the challenges that we're facing is the fact that our system is set up to mimic um, a criminal justice system. So we run almost a, you know, like a mirrored version of a criminal justice system. And so all of the problems that come along with the criminal justice system, even though we're running internal procedures at a balance of probabilities, the way we structure things to look similar to that, where you've got an investigation, you've got, has that been founded or not, is essentially going then to a discipline process. It's like if the police investigated and then they handed over the prosecution and prosecution against the perpetrator, right? We're doing the same thing in a university. We're saying investigation, complaint, then it goes to discipline, and then it's university against the student or staff member who's committed a form of misconduct. And that uh, reporting party is lacking in rights and accessibility versus looking at it as a true civil process. And so I think that that's something as a sector we should be thinking about. And then the second, or excuse me, the third thing I just wanted to mention is our view of, I'll, I'll talk about this in relation to sexual violence, but do think about it more widely in your own context. Um, our view of misconduct when it relates to students or staff. And are we holding students to a higher standard? Are we using harsher sanctions with students than we are with staff because we're concerned about employment law and going to tribunal? Um, and so I think if we're kicking students out for behavior, we need to be thinking about dismissing staff for the same type of behavior. Um, if we're gonna say that sexual violence is a safety issue in our community, we need to be thinking about how we're holding students and staff uh, accountable if they do commit those forms of misconduct in our institution. It's a short list, but it could be longer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm absolutely certain it could. Um, and even within that, that's such a rich response there. Um, uh, Georgina, I'd like to come to you next, particularly, um, you know, as we've touched on there, the kind of reflection of the criminal system. I think it will be interesting to hear your view on um, the barriers that you see uh, um, institutions facing against from your perspective. Yes, absolutely. Gosh, Clarissa, you say a short list. I've given a space to jot down all you'd said, and there's so much, so much that we could talk about for a long time on. But um, I guess the, the, the two points I'll pick out, and then I'll add an extra point. Um, you touched on the getting leadership on board, and I think that is so absolutely important because it then reflects back on um, what Danny was saying, and you picked up on that, Clarissa, about how the system was there, the processes were there, but when Danny spoke to an individual, the individual said, well, be careful what you do because it may be bad for you within the department. And that individual was sadly reflecting probably the state of affairs as they actually exist. And so was was trying to be well-meaning. I imagine it, it was a well-meaning thing, possibly, um, because perhaps in actual fact, you would um, face some repercussions within the department, even though it would be unlawful for you to face those reper repercussions. And that's why I think having leadership on board is so important, because it ought to be the fact that people can lean into things, make complaints, do what is right, administrators do what is right, what the processes allow them to do, and not have to second guess how it might be undermined in reality by the faculty or the way the departments are set up and the assumptions they make both about sexual violence and about each other's security of tenure in their job. Um, and so I think you need to get leadership on board in order to have a whole mindset change across the entire hierarchy of the university system. Um, and then the criminal justice system, yes, absolutely, Clarissa. I mean, I think this is at the heart of why the disciplinary processes are unfit for purpose or at least they're unfit to be used as a um, sexual harassment or misconduct complaints process because they were originally created to deal with 
academic infractions like plagiarism um, or, or other sort of academic problems where there is the person that is hurt is the institution ultimately because if you're a plagiarist it doesn't look good reputationally for the um, research standing of the institution and so there it, it sort of makes sense um, where there's one individual involved for the university to adopt a quasi criminal like system because a dismissal is um, I suppose the equivalent of a kind of execution if you're using that analogy and so um, given that the individual faces some sort of sanction, then it makes sense to, to adopt the criminal justice system, which has embedded within it certain rights and protections for the person accused. And no one wants to get rid of that. What we want to point out is that with sexual harassment, if you use it for sexual harassment or misconduct complaints, you have two individuals involved. And so you, you have to treat them with parity. You have to give the same protections to both because it is not true that the only person who faces sanction is the accused. Also, the complainant faces a very similar sanction because if their complaint is not um, handled appropriately and if sanctions are not imposed where they should be imposed so that they can continue their education in a safe place, they effectively have no education at all because many of my clients have had to drop out of university and sadly haven't even got the degree that they've worked so hard to get that they have made and their family has often made many sacrifices for them to try to obtain. They've just had to fall, fall out and um, seek a future elsewhere. So both sides face sanction directly and indirectly, but that's reason enough for them both to be treated equally within the process. Um, not to mention also the fact Clarissa touched on that this is not a criminal justice system. In fact, no one is being sent to jail. It is more um, a system whereby the university owes duty of care, which is a civil responsibility towards everyone within the community, the staff and the students. Um, so, uh, yes, those are those are big problems. And I really, really hope that um, universities will get on board with adjusting their disciplinary systems so that they allow a place for two equal parties. Um, another real problem that I see frequently arising is the overuse of confidentiality and um, partly NDAs. NDAs can be misused too, but um, that's less common in my experience than the use of confidentiality as Sometimes it seems almost like an excuse to keep everything hidden. And that can be quite useful for, for people because you, what you have done cannot be subject to scrutiny if, um, if it's hidden and treated as confidential. And um, this is not just skullduggery. There is a, a basis for keeping some things confidential. So it is a real problem with the structure. And um, the problem is this. Universities have many different competing duties, legal duties that they have to comply with. And one is the Equality Act, which we've all been talking about. But another is um, the Data Protection Act and um, observing and keeping confidential individuals, private or personal data, um, things like their names, their identities, information about them, which has been entrusted to the university. And as any institution or employer, a university has to keep them um, confidential in, um, in certain respects. And it has certain duties to, to process that data in a way that's compliant with the Data Protection Act. Um, unfortunately, well, and the Data Protection Act also comes um, brings with it some really hefty enforcement penalties if universities get it wrong. There's like a, there is an immediate fine that the Information Commissioner's Office can impose in a way that um, the EHRC has no corresponding right to suddenly impose a fine on any organisation which is breaching the Equality Act. So understandably then, when faced with a potential fine from the ICO, universities tend to prioritise people's privacy rights because they don't want to get it wrong. And um, because of that, and because the Data Protection Act is quite complex and the um, reasons where you can um, disclose other third parties personal information is is quite complex means that many administrators have just been told to err on the side of caution and to the extent you can avoid disclosing anyone's information to anyone else you will be safer from a privacy law perspective 
And that may be right, but the privacy law was never meant to be a trump card that would trump every other human right that individuals have. And individuals do have equality rights and they should not always be trumped by privacy law. And I think even the ICO would recognize that. Unfortunately, the ICO was invited to um, provide guidance on exactly what universities could and could not share um, so that they administrators would know how to proceed. And I'm sad to say that they delegated that down to Universities UK, I believe, who probably delegated it down to a privacy lawyer. Um, but but I, I don't, it has yet to come out. The point is it's yet to come out. And so um, we're all waiting to see what the guidance will be. But the headline point is the privacy law is not the be all and end all of universities obligations, but it's often used in that way so that complainants are not given, for example, even the outcome um, into their very own complaint. And they're often not given evidence that has been submitted against them to question their credibility, when if only they had been given that evidence, they could have easily refuted some of the factual inaccuracies. Um, so I think privacy law is another standout issue um, that has to be resolved, but does present real problems to individuals on the ground trying to do a good thing. Thank you for that, Georgina. Um, Danny, I'm going to come to you for your thoughts next. I'm just conscious of time. I'm having some really good questions coming in, which I think the next question that I'll ask you will help to cover some of those. Um, so, Danny, we'll come to you next and then we'll, we'll, we'll shortly move on to the great questions that are coming through in the chat. And please do keep those coming. Wonderful, yeah. Um, well, I'll keep it short because Clarissa and, and Georgina have covered so much. Um, I think I, I agree with, with everything that's been said. I think there's a few main barriers. I'd like to talk a bit about people because I think there are a lot of people on this call that that may be supporting students through these processes or maybe running these processes. Um, and I do think that sometimes one of the biggest barriers can be can be individuals. So and a lot of this comes down to lack of appropriate training or appropriate um, qualifications or putting the appropriate person in that role. So, you know, for example, in my case, the person that <clears throat> was kind of representing the university who was um, investigating um, joked to me once that the only experience they had was watching um, legal shows on Netflix. And I'm sure they meant that as a kind of break the tension you know, reassuring thing to me, maybe. Um, but if they had been appropriately trained, I'm sure that they would have realized that that wasn't very reassuring to me, that my case was being handled by someone whose only experience was watching Law and Order on Netflix. Um, and, and, you know, there are the, there is so many examples of that I could use. I, I had uh, another member of staff tell me that um, I, if I wanted a career um, in my discipline, I should be careful to separate the personal from the professional and not tell anyone about my case. And when I asked well, who's 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 that coming from, they said, "Well, I can just tell you that comes from the top." Now I don't know if by the top they meant the vice chancellor or they meant by the head of my department, or they were making it up and it was coming from them. So I do think that even well-meaning people who aren't trained and aren't qualified properly to be running these procedures can do harm without even necessarily meaning it. I think that can only be solved by strong leadership and, and training and resource. And, and that's another big issue is the resource. And that can only be solved by making it, as Clarissa said, a strategic priority, which the, the exceeding expectations um, guidance points out. Without the appropriate resource into these types of procedures and, and into the staff that are running them, you know, these types of procedures shouldn't ideally be run by academic staff as kind of an extra on top of their workload. It also shouldn't be run by, um, you know, uh, professional well-being staff as an extra to all of the other students that they have to support with their with with mental health issues and, and in that well-being area. It should be a dedicated department, a dedicated role that's that's sufficiently funded. Um, I think another issue that we face as a sector is, is patchy regulation. So there's lots of best practice guidance out there, um, that, but there's not one piece of guidance that covers everything. And there's many areas where, as to my knowledge, there isn't appropriate guidance on. So, you know, it's only been the last couple of years that universities have started to investigate uh, instances that occurred off campus, um, even if they occurred, you know, between members of the community. Um, it even I think this week the 1752 group have put out an open letter um, asking for there to be guidance created on how universities should handle complaints from multiple parties if multiple people are complaining against about the same person. 
Um, in my case, because of patchy regulations, someone that, the person that I was accusing who had a supervisory a teaching role over me was tried as a student, um, even though they were in a supervisory role over me. So there are lots of kind of instances where cases fall through the cracks or universities don't know what to do because the guidance isn't thorough enough, the guidance isn't cohesive, there isn't any mandate from the Office for Students, there isn't, you know, the OIA the OIA intervenes only in the most extreme cases and very rarely. Um, and so I think, I mean, that there are tons of barriers, but I think what we really need is, is we, we really need m mandated regulations from, from the OFS with, with, as a condition of registration. I think it would be amazing if it was actually part of the APP, which is something the universities have to go through to be able to charge full tuition fees. So they wouldn't be able to charge full tuition fees if they weren't tackling these um, issues seriously. Students from from those um, bodies, from those regulatory bodies, universities need to be taking a strategic lead on this and making it a strategic issue. Thank you for that, Danny. Um, so, our, from the discussion that I've had that you've just that you've all been having there, it feels like there's two real problems. One, uh, the process itself whether we're talking at an institutional level or more structurally looking at the guidance that's available, but then also how individuals interpret and carry out action based on that. Um, and then I suppose given that a lot of this can't be changed quickly and overnight, but people need to continue doing their jobs tomorrow and the next day, um, I want to go on and talk about kind of advice that we can give to practitioners in creating more effective change. And to do that, I'd like to kind of jump into some of the questions that we've got coming in. So the first one's from Mickey Holman, who uh, says that the panels acknowledge the guidance from the bodies issuing uh, it is insufficient and spoken to the issues of structural barriers uh, and mimicking. I would like to hear the panel's proposals or thoughts uh, of how they would see these things being dealt with, starting from a blank slate. So anybody that would like to go first on that? Go ahead, Georgina. Well, um, I'm happy to because I've got a, a, a many page, I think, gosh, it's rather too long document that would answer that question. Um, and complete caveat, I took a role in authoring it and drafting it. Um, seeing this um, vacuum for a real step by step guide, the 1752 group, and I helped them, um, drafted what we called a sector guidance which would give a step by step. It says exactly what we, how we would do things if we were given a blank slate. Um, we didn't, we also acknowledge the fact that universities have got to put a lot of thought into their existing disciplinary processes. So even if you don't have a blank slate, but you have a sort of real world situation, you can take your existing processes and tweak them. They are substantial and critical tweaks, but it, they're not, um, tweaks that would cost anyone too much money um, insofar as you just change everywhere where you accord a particular um, protection and right to the reported student or staff member, the accused, you give that same right to the, um, the complaining, the reporting student or staff member or the complainant. Um, and then you would have a much, much better structure from which to start. And then you do... Um, you have to acknowledge another thing I would acknowledge is this confidentiality thing. Well, it is actually acknowledged within that sector guidance that um, you, you don't uh, you, you provide evidence to each side. So you do not cover that in confidentiality. You don't need to provide it to everyone or post it on the Internet. You have to keep everyone's information as carefully as possible. But um, it is necessary to address someone's complaint. And so you do have to share it with them. So that would be permissible. And you also need to address the problem of recidivism. Most sexual harassers don't stop at one victim. They will target um, more, perhaps each year, they target a new one or more than one new, new person. And so you do need to keep some sort of very carefully maintained database of um, past of, of complaints that have come in, whether they're formal complaints or informal, so that an investigator in a subsequent complaint can go back and see whether there have been a number of previous complaints about the same person, because then you will avoid the inevitable he said, she said conundrum, which means that even where someone is complained about every year, if each year the complaints are treated absolutely independently and in isolation so that each year 
um, harassment cannot be proven on the balance of probabilities. Um, you would get beyond that because you'd see that actually it's not one complainant against one perpetrator, it's perhaps 10 complainants against one perpetrator. And so the, the balance of probabilities would shift then. Thank you, Georgina. Is there, uh, was there any more thoughts from yourself there, Clarissa? Yeah, I just I just wanted to add that I, I think it's all about that, those equal rights. And I think that... Um, <sighs> In utopia, starting from scratch would be fantastic, and I would love to be able to have that ability to do that. Um, but in reality, we that this sector takes a long time to change things. Um, for a sector that's all about learning and research and innovation, and we take time um, to, to make changes. And that's why um, the the book that I wrote with Graham Tal, um, we wrote it not from a point of what we would like everything to look like, but in this, in the context that we're in at the moment, in the the way that students are treated as customers, you know, all of those things that are in the sector at the moment. Um, what are steps that you can do to to actually make positive change? And so we developed this comprehensive institution wide approach that is trauma informed, survivor centered. It's social justice based, human rights based. It's intersectional. It or intersectional. It requires um, perpetrator accountability, and it's a at the socio-ecological model of the individual, the relationship, the community, and the institution. And, um, and that was, so in the same way that exceeding expectations has taken the OFS guidance and said, yes, that's, that's you know, a, a base. Those are some bones. That's a framework. However, what we actually need is we need more. We need to do it this way. That's kind of what we, we've done in the book as well for sexual violence, at least, to say, um, you know, every element of what you do needs to be trauma-informed, survivor-centered. You need to have perpetrator accountability. It needs to be intersectional, you know. And so in that strate strategic, in that operationalized um, elements of every um, of part that you do as an institution, um, adding in those elements to it will make it an ethical approach where you're protecting all parties involved and you're giving everybody the equal opportunity and you're giving people safer processes if those elements are, are embedded within every moment from disclosure to discipline um, and, and everything in between. Um, that's kind of what we were looking for. And I'll just say I don't get any money from the book. All proceeds go to the Rape and Sexual Abuse Counseling Center. So I will advertise it because uh, we wrote it so it could be helpful if it is. Um, but yeah, if, if we could start from scratch, as Georgina was saying there, that equal that equal set of rights is where we would begin. Uh, but if you can't start from scratch, having an ethical approach is is what I would be promoting. And then over to you, Danny. Um, I suppose from your perspective that um, kind of with Carissa speaking there about the kind of taking that survivor-centric approach, it would be great to get your views from that student perspective on advice that you'd give to people doing the job in how we can start to make change? Yeah, I mean, I think my main advice would be follow Clarissa's book and, and the 1752 guidance. I think that it is kind of all covered there in terms of the practical steps to take. I think the most important thing that needs to change at the moment is, is the fact that, that complainants are treated as witnesses, which I think is totally inappropriate. And, and I recognise that that was initially created to help take the burden off the complainant. So it wasn't the complainant versus the perpetrator, but instead it, it's, it's resulted in a scenario where um, complainants have no right to legal representation, no right to appeal, um, <clears throat> no right to have a say in the the makeup of the panel. Like, but perpetrators in some institutions can decide what type of people sit on the panel, um, which just seems really strange to me. Um, so, I, for me, I think that's that's the biggest thing that needs to change. I think complainants need to be treated as complainants and 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 not as as witnesses. Um, I think as well, something which we haven't touched on, but I think it's really important is disability discrimination within these procedures, particularly mental health discrimination within these procedures. So in my case, I had a uh, I had had experience of depression previously, um, and this was used as as a almost evidence that I was an unreliable witness because I'd had previous mental health struggles, um, which I can't see any way in which that wouldn't be disability discrimination under law um there was even and I, I think I could probably still three years later quote it by heart which was Danny's mental health struggles compel her to always want to be the center of attention um, and that was used as a that was used as their defense basically because I had text message evidence the only thing that they could try and do was discredit my character um, and I haven't seen much sector discussion on how 
disability discrimination is actually used as a weapon within these procedures sometimes. I think that that's a that's a big um, area which which I see I see a bit of a vacuum there for, for discussion. Um, but apart from that, I would just say read Clarissa and Graham's book and the 1752 guidance. Thanks for that, Danny. Um, I think we've got about six minutes left until we want to start the breakout. So I think maybe we have what time for one last question if we can um, get the responses in. Um, I'll go to this one. So formal complaint systems have many problems, as you've all pointed out so well. Also, they tend to be a last resort. What do the panel think about informal anti-harassment networks with trained staff, which may address some, but not all, uh, issues before they escalate and may in some cases help to avoid lengthy uh, complaints processes? Danny, you're on my screen, so do you want to do you want to kick off with that? Yeah, I mean, I think as long as the staff members are properly trained and, and these things are properly resourced, they should be an option. Restorative justice um, procedures and informal procedures should be an option to students. A lot of students don't want to go through a formal complaint, but a lot of them don't, you know, as, as you mentioned, it's it's length, lengthy and, it, and it's very taxing, especially whilst trying to do a degree at the same time. And so if things can be resolved beforehand, they, they absolutely should be before having to go through... Um, that type of of uh, ordeal but in an, in an ideal world it wouldn't be so arduous it wouldn't be so difficult it wouldn't be so lengthy so in, in the situation we're in at the moment I think that those types of more informal um, options are good as long as the staff are trained it's well resourced it's 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 overseen as well appropriately but in an ideal world we you know that an official disciplinary process wouldn't be such a horrible experience. It would be something that would be more accessible to the students that wanted to use it. Of course, not all students will want to. Uh, and then can I go over to you, Clarissa? Absolutely. So I, I agree. I think we are um, we're at risk of following the mistakes that have been made in the states. Uh, the states have obviously been doing um, these kinds of discipline processes and complaints processes for decades now. And, um, and so I think there's a lot of learning to be had in relation to what works and what doesn't work, but also what do survivors particularly of sexual violence, consider justice, um, but all forms of harassment. What is it, you know, being led by the person who was subjected to the harm, I think it has to be part of our process and allowing for additional ways. Now, there are things that I think are, would not be appropriate for like an informal uh, process, but there are other processes like transformative justice and or restorative justice that can be done safely. Um, and, and we have other countries that have been doing this in higher education sector uh, well. And so I think that we, we, I don't know that we've seen any of that happen yet in the UK. Um, I know restorative justice is, is coming from a criminal justice point of view. So again, if we don't want to try to mimic and mirror what the criminal justice system is, transformative justice is a community-based led uh, process that's similar, um, but, but different. And uh, I'm not an expert on it, so I won't pretend to kind of explain it out in this succinct in a succinct, succinct way here but um all of that to say um i think that there are other avenues that higher education sectors internationally are exploring and we can learn and we can work and particularly since we don't have any specific regulation that says we have to do it one way i think that that means that there's some flexibility as a sector for us to ex explore what's going to help keep our students and staff safe Brilliant. Thanks, Carissa. Georgina, sorry, we have slightly run out of time. <laughs> if there was anything pre pre um, pressing that you wanted to add to that? No, I think it's been covered really excellently by by the others, and I'm pleased to learn to learn more about these other systems in other jurisdictions because it can be very um, polarizing to have a formal process. And so, if it can be resolved in some other more community wide way, I think that that's probably a really good thing. Yeah, and I think um, this this you know whole idea of knowledge sharing and then looking overseas. Of course, most institutions have partners overseas that that those connections can be made with. I think there's a lot of power in that, um, and. You know, on the topic of knowledge sharing, we'll be next be moving into our into our breakout rooms. Um, there are many more questions in the chat that I just wish we had the time to answer, um, and 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 we don't in this part of the session. But what we can do is take those questions away um, and maybe put them to our panelists. Now we also have our knowledge forum coming up um, from the 29th of November, so please do keep a lookout for that. And if you do want to attend um, that as a partner event uh, for Culture Shift, then please do get in touch. We can make sure that you're signed up to that.